Well, good morning, everyone, and um, and thank you for joining us um, and um, attending for attending our special webinar event on accessing um, new markets for international growth. Um, before we get going, I'd love lo like to stop and um, we and start with an acknowledgement uh, of the traditional owners. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the country on which we meet today. Um, myself on the Boonarong country of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge all elders, past, present, as well as the future leaders who continue their role as pro proud custodians of the country that they belong. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our Indigenous colleagues and customers who join us here today. In partnership uh, with the Export Council of Australia, NAB is pleased to bring you this insight session around accessing new export markets to aid business growth, as well as a global economic outlook for the year ahead. Today, we'll hear um, from experts around the importance of managing currency risk and business cash flow. In addition, we are lucky to have an Australian exporting business joining us today to give us their insights into their experiences in, um, in growing their businesses business into offshore markets. Both NAB and the Export Council are committed to providing Australian businesses with ongoing support and opportunities to gain valuable insights to ensure that they benefit the, their businesses. Through this webinar today, we will aim to assist you in understanding which markets Australian businesses are eyeing, uh, where there are potential expansion opportunities, and what factors may get in the way of this, um, with a discussion uh, with the Export Council around the findings of Australia's International Business Survey, which was only released last Tuesday. Um, throughout this session, we'll also aim to assist you in understanding the importance of currency risk management and cash flow management, especially for those looking to expand or establish themselves in new markets that they haven't operated in previously. Um, before we get going, just a couple of housekeeping pieces. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box uh, within the Zoom facility and we'll cover these uh, during our Q&A session after we hear from our presenters today. So to kick off our session today, um, first we'll hear from Arnold George, who is the CEO of the Export Council of Australia. Arnold is a former senior trade di uh, official, diplomat and consultant with over 20 years of experience in international trade, aid, entrepreneurship and marketing. His previous positions include principal advisor within the Washington DC based Center for International Private Enterprise. He was a director of aid for trade in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and deputy head of the mission of the Australian Embassy in Mexico City. He represented Australia in global forums and trade negotiations, including the World Trade Organization, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum and Trans-Pacific Partnership Negotiation. He has um, a master's degree in business administration and is skilled in lean startup and agile methodologies and aid for trade project design and management. Um, so I think um, you know, with that, you can certainly see he's uh, well credentialed to, to be talking to us about uh, offshore markets and everything else that comes with that. So please join me in welcoming Arnold. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, glad to be joining you today. Uh, very much appreciate National Australia Bank uh, initiating this discussion this morning. Uh, for my brief presentation, um, as you noted, I wanted to share uh, with you uh, the key findings from Australia's International Business Survey for 2021. Uh, the findings may be of interest, especially among exporters uh, looking to new markets overseas, and for exporters to know that uh, you were not alone in facing the very difficult circumstances in the last year or two. Uh, there were nearly 700 businesses that contributed to the survey. 90% 90, 90 of them uh, were actually small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, the conditions for the last 12 to 18 months have been uh, extraordinary. Uh, COVID, including related restrictions, uh, supply chain constraints, uh, and geopolitics have uh, been major disruptive factors. Uh, these have transformed the global and domestic uh, business landscape. Sometimes it feels like we've jumped into uh, some kind of a parallel universe. Uh, anyway, well, 87% uh, of those uh, surveyed agreed that conditions have been tougher than usual in the last 12 to 18 months. 
despite the conditions though, some have actually done quite well. 25% actually saw an improvement in their financial situation. There are others uh, that did not do so well. Uh, in fact, a greater proportion, 55% uh, saw their financial situation deteriorate, uh, deteriorate during the period. Uh, small exporters were hit harder than larger exporters. Uh, industries that were hardest hit were in tourism, uh, construction and agriculture. Uh, less affected were professional services, uh, those in manufacturing and mining. Uh, for many exporters, a key challenge, challenge was the inability to travel. 90% of businesses nominated this as being problematic. Uh, many, of course, use Zoom and, and other web-based platforms. Uh, nevertheless, these technologies uh, revealed their limitations. Um, unable to meet and engage with potential partners and buyers in person, uh, many businesses found it difficult to build relationships and actually finalize contracts. Uh, those doing deals in Asia where relationships are key were especially impacted. Uh, the delays, lack of availability and skyrocketing costs in both air and sea freight uh, have also hurt many exporters. On average, 40% of exporters registered these as disruptive issues. Uh, in connection to this, uh, exporters have actually told us, separate to the survey, uh, that they have lost contracts because they could not guarantee delivery within the customer specified time frame. Uh, we know of an auto component manufacturer that lost contracts with Tesla uh, because of this situation. Uh, many have actually lost uh, significant profits and others have decided just to step away from exporting altogether uh, because of the chaos, uh, in particular with containerized uh, sea freight. Other challenges raised by Australian exporters included restrictions imposed by foreign governments, uh, but these have had less uh, negative impact. The survey did reveal some interesting results, uh, including the perception of India uh, being particularly difficult market from a regulatory standpoint may actually be overstated. Uh, moving forward, 80% uh, of Australian businesses intend to expand the range of markets they export to uh, in order to manage the risk much better in the future. Those businesses seeking to enter new markets were more likely to be medium-sized, um, followed by small businesses and then large businesses. So what are the top markets of interest among exporters seeking to diversify? The number one market is the UK, followed closely by the United States and Japan. Uh, next are Canada and China, but there seems to be a declining interest in, in, in these markets. Uh, there are also uh, strong interest in Indonesia, Germany, uh, South Korea, India, uh, as well as France. That was probably before the AUKUS announcement. Um, while uh, contemplating diversification seems easy enough, making it happen may not be that straightforward. There are a number of challenges to diversification. Exporters noted in particular the cost of entering new market, meeting the regulatory requirements of foreign governments, logistics issues, lack of access to distribution networks, and lack of access to market intelligence. So the, the, the cost of entering a new market was a particular challenge for those looking to export to Hong Kong, uh, to France and to the United Arab Emirates. In terms of securing reliable market intelligence, many exporters uh, told us that this was especially challenging in the Philippines uh, and, and South Korea. Uh, so while things have been tough, uh, Australian exporters seem to be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, almost two in three uh, or 64% felt their business would be better off financially in the next 12 months. 62% uh, of exporters also believe their turnover would grow in a year's time. So uh, the type of business the most, uh, with the most optimistic outlook tended to be uh, the large businesses and were exporting to more markets. So uh, it is encouraging that despite all of the challenges and with exporters uh, facing a very competitive global setting, many are turning their attention to environmental sustainability and efforts to reduce emissions. Uh, half of Australian exporters reported that reducing the environmental impact of their operations was a priority. Uh, Michael, in light of the time, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, the AIBS report is available on our website for anyone who may be interested to learn more. Uh, I'll now pass the uh, virtual microphone to uh, Leon Scaliotis. Uh, Leon is the general man manager of Flavortech uh, Propriety Limited and has been with Flavortech for over 16 years. 
Uh, Leon also has an MBA and many years of sales experience working across uh, various industries prior to joining Flavortech. Uh, Flavortech is a global technology manufacturer specializing in aroma recovery, uh, extraction and evaporation for the food, beverage and pharmaceutical industries. Headquartered in Australia, they export to more than 60 countries. They have a global network of offices, distributors and agents. So uh, Leon is well-placed to share with us uh, Flavortech's experience in expanding to new markets. Uh, Leon, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Arnold. And uh, I was one of those people that completed that survey. And uh, a lot of those items that you just mentioned resonate uh, with what Flavortech found over the last two years um, with what has occurred around the world. Having a team that, you know, having half our team travel most of the time, there was a huge impact in how we uh, communicated with customers around the world and, and virtual meetings like this became the norm. So anyway, I'll, I'll get started. Um, I'm honored to be invited to talk uh, here and thank you very much for the invitation from the NAB and the Export Council. And I hope what I have to say over the next five minutes or so uh, helps exporters uh, in Australia uh, take their products around the world. As Arnold mentioned, Flavortech is an Australian company. We started about 40 years ago uh, to manufacture a piece of equipment like the, the one that you see in the picture there, a lot of stainless steel, very, very shiny. And it was used to originally to remove sulfite from grape juice. Well, that was the intended application. Um, the founders of, of, of Flavortech, after two or so years of trying to, to sell it into the wine industry to remove sulfites from, from grape juice with no success, um, we're just about to give up when one of their customers said, hey, can this remove alcohol from wine? And that was really the start of, of Flavortech because not only was that uh, trial very successful, but that made us pioneers in this zero alcohol market that is, is now growing around the world. You know? And uh, it, it, we often joke about the 80s and 90s when we were approaching wine and beer companies saying, hey, you, know, you can make zero alcohol beer and wine, and you know, then pointing to the door and saying, you know, nobody's going to drink anything like that. So the world changed, but we listened to our customers, we adapted, and now we're one of the principal manufacturers for natural aroma recovery um, from food um, and uh, food and um, vegetable products uh, all around the world. Uh, we have uh, what we try and achieve for our customers is really high quality products and our unique proposition is that we can do this using very short residence times and low temperatures so we are going to the market with something that's quite unique and, and quite new um, our competitors are companies global companies that have 15,000 or 20,000 staff members we're only a company of around 60 people but we're punching way above our weight we're in various industries around the world. So if you've been to Japan and had canned coffee, it's probably been made on, on Flavortech equipment. If you've had instant coffee just about anywhere around the world, the aroma in that instant coffee has been captured through our spinning cone column. Um, um, the alcoholic beverage industry, of course, uh, for zero alcohol, beer and wine that's growing now. Active ingredients in the pharmaceutical and um, nutraceutical industry, and of course, flavor companies all around the world are using our technologies and have made the spinning cone column the standard piece of equipment to capture those natural flavors that then go into products like muesli bars, um, candy, uh, sauces, you name it. Some of our customers are, are global giants. Um, you may have heard of some of these companies, whether they're in the food industry or the spice industry, the coffee industry, the alcohol industry. Um, we all we have stories with all of them. Synthite, that name that you see there, first came, we first came across this Indian spice company back in the 90s. Um, and it was a small family company. They are now the largest spice company in the world. Um, and we'd like to think that we had a, a role to play in that, giving them a unique technology to make very unique products that helped capture more and more market share for them. And they have multiple equipment from us. 
Fonterra removes grass flavor from their cream to make Western star butter and to make other butters. And that grass flavor that they remove is really an undesirable flavor. And if you can, you know, if you can imagine what grass turns into, that sort of gives you an idea what that flavor is that we actually remove from that butter um, and that cream. Um, so these customers are, are global. As I mentioned, they've made their equipment stand, our equipment standard in their factories. Next slide, please. Um, to be able to better look after our customers, we've had to position ourselves all around the world. And you can see here where we have our own people. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, we're in America, we're in Central America, we're over in Europe, we're in India. And what, but what this doesn't show is the agents and distributors that we have in a lot of countries throughout uh, South America and throughout Asia. More than 90% of what we manufacture is exported. Now, we didn't just set up all around the world all at once. It was a staged process. And as Arnold sort of mentioned earlier, a lot of people are looking at the UK to export to or America or, or Canada. And really, the ease of doing business with somebody that speaks the same, same language makes it easy to go into, into those countries. Where it becomes a little bit more difficult is to go into countries where you know, English isn't, isn't the first language and you may not know the customs or the cultures. So what Flavortech has done in the past is approached government departments like the Export Council, like um, Austrade, like Investment New South Wales to get the right knowledge, uh, to get the right contacts. Um, next slide, please. And I'm trying to stay within the five minutes here. You can see here over the last 10 years where our sales have occurred. And what we've really seen a growth in in the last 10 years is India and China. Uh, in fact, this year we've had a, a customer in China order 10 of those large systems um, for their iced tea uh, market and business over there in China, which is, is growing phenomenally. Um, this is keeping us extremely busy. And it's, it's only a market that we first entered about 10 years ago with any sort of gusto. Um, so it's really making a difference. Um, to explore these markets, we've gone on business tours with Investment New South Wales, um, and we've made contacts with Austrade offices um, in the various countries. And it's always great to actually go across there, meet somebody from Austrade, um, and find out who you should be dealing with, who you should be networking with, and of course, business matching. They do a lot of the groundwork for you, so you can actually fly in and know you've got meetings every day with different people to help you cover that market and, and get a good understanding of that market. Um, so, but you need to make a plan. So you need to find out whether it's the right market for you um, and your products, whether you will be able to export there. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, you need to find out from the Export Council, you know, what sort of INCO terms those companies in those countries uh, will, will work under. Um, it's, it's always nice to get financial assistance, I suppose, from organizations like Investment New South Wales and Business New South Wales to help with marketing activities. And you've got to increase your profile. So what we did with the countries that we were looking at was trying to increase our profile. We looked at industry specific conferences or exhibitions where we could make presentations or we could have a, a booth. And quite often the money that assisted us to achieve that was through these um, government organizations. We're not a large company, but we have 23 different nationalities that, that work at Flavortech. And it's always um, always amazes our customers when they pick up the phone and you know our technical manager or one of our service engineers talks to them in their own language. It really facilitates the, the whole process and makes it easier. Enter any awards that you can, um, and hopefully you will win them because those sort of credentials help you um, win business. Um, last night, um, I had a late night call to Poland. Uh, we've never sold to Poland before, and we've been talking with the customer there, and the owner wanted to, to meet us, or to meet me specifically, and make sure that they were dealing with the right company to, to buy a piece of our equipment. Our equipment does cost a couple of million dollars, uh, so it's a big investment for some of these companies. Um, once we told them that we'd won the export 
awards uh, several times and we won the manufacturing awards and we'd won other business awards. It really ticked all the boxes for them that they were dealing with the right company uh, and we were going to be around for a while. Um, we answered all their questions on how to get the, uh, the equipment over there and how to transfer it, how they should pay for it. Um, and it really made a, made a difference for them. Um, and they're going to be going ahead with that sale. So based on all of this information, we're, we're looking at these markets growing and you can see the, the little arrows there and we're working on further plans to increase sales in these markets. So we've employed people in India, we've got offices and a pilot plant facility in, in the US um, and we're looking at growing these markets over the next five years um, because there is a lot of potential there. Best source of information, is those government bodies. So don't hesitate to contact Export Council, don't hesitate to contact Austrade, and of course, Investment New South Wales and Business New South Wales to get the right information. And that all leads to you being more successful when you export out there. So I've hoped to, hope I've stayed within five minutes. If you've got questions, please jot them down and I'll see how I can help at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leon, and, and thank you, Arnold, uh, for the, the uh, insights that you've just uh, shared. Um, Arnold, uh, I have to say, in my conversations with a lot of our customers thinking about uh, doing business off offshore, the countries that you nominated are the, the countries that they're talking about, specifically the UK, on the back of the recent uh, you know, trade arrangements that we've put in place between Australia and the UK uh, following Brexit. And also, Leon, it was unbelievably fascinating to hear you know, the uh, flavour tech story and um, it uh, it really um, it reminds me of a lot of conversations that I have with customers that link their their um, their fortunes to accidental finds and you know being able to identify that it actually removes alcohol out of wine and creates a whole new market was the uh, opportunity that uh, Flavor Tech took uh, advantage of and, and it's great to see these stories in terms of expansion and so forth. So looking forward to no doubt uh, talking to you through some the Q and A session. Um, next, I'm really pleased to introduce Tapas Strickland from uh, Tapas is our Director of Economics and Markets for NAB. Anyone that gets our morning uh, update um, and podcast would probably know Tapas's voice, um, given that uh, he's a regular feature um, on our uh, overnight uh, call, which is the NAB morning call po podcast. If you're not on it, I certainly suggest um, that you sign up for it. Um, it's the way I start my day every every morning, and um, and it's always good to hear Tapas's uh, insights and other um, members of our economics team as to what's going on overnight. Um, Tapas has uh, most recently spent time in our London office and he, um, he basically works hand in hand with a lot of our, our customers, anything, anyone from a SME to our major institutional customers. Uh, he was, uh, uh, and prior to, to NAB, Tapas spent six years at the RBA and also worked as an economic advisor in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet advising uh, the governments of Gillard, Rudd and Abbott. Uh, Tapas, um, with that introduction, over to you to get, provide uh, your up-to-date insights on, on uh, where we're at. Uh, thank you, Michael, and very much glad to be with you here and very encouraging to hear from the Export Council about how optimistic exporters are, just given how uncertain the environment is at the moment. I think it's fair to say what I prepared to present today has uh, tweaked quite a bit, just given the emergence of the Omicron virus variant. And I thought for today, I'll just explain a little bit in terms of how we're viewing the recovery in the light of that variant. Um, also give a little bit more description in terms of what is going on in rates markets and in FX, which continue to be very volatile, just given uh, all the disruptions that are going on uh, in the global economy at the moment. And finally, just touching a little bit in terms of exporters, some of the geopolitical developments that have occurred and that have caused Australian exporters to try and pivot and find alternative markets. So first off, in terms of Omicron, uh, it's still very early days in terms of whether um, we know whether this virus is more impactful in terms of um, health outcomes or indeed whether it escapes current vaccine that we have. The early anecdotes that we do have are entirely from South Africa and so far uh, some of the doctors in South Africa is reporting it's relatively mild 
with a major caveat there obviously being the cases so far have involved mostly younger people. So we will be watching quite closely the developments in South Africa and Europe over the next couple of weeks uh, in terms of trying to assess the severity of the virus variant. Uh, in addition to that, if the virus variant was found to be relatively mild and highly infectious, then it could actually accelerate the process towards uh, living with this virus. So I think that's the key thing to note here. I think it's too early to make a concrete assessment here. There are both upside and downside uh, scenarios in regards to Omicron, and we really don't know until the next couple of weeks are over. I'm an, op I'm an optimist, but also a realist here, and so there's just a lot of uncertainty going on here. I think in terms of global implications from Omicron so far is many parts of the world are still operating a zero COVID strategy, so haven't made the transition to living with the virus, and that continues to disrupt global supply chains right around the world. And China in particular has maintained its zero COVID strategy. So whenever there is a virus development in China, they lock down that specific regional area, and that disrupts global supply chains. And I think it's quite likely that uh, that process will continue. A lot of countries are relying on the rollout of booster programs in order to make that transition to starting to live with the virus. And China is currently rolling out its booster program and is likely to be fully in place uh, by the middle of next year. So our view is those supply chain disruptions, those high freight costs that a lot of our exporters are having to pay for, are likely to persist for a bit longer than what we had initially expected, and we may not actually get too much of an easing up on those pressures until the middle of next year. We are starting to see a few anecdotes of freight rates starting to decline as you say to get a pivot from the good side of the economy and more towards the services side of the economy, uh, but so far uh, that pivot has been a little bit slower in terms of playing out. Uh, in terms of uh, the outlook for rates and for currencies, the main point that I wanted to illustrate is that the low point in the interest rate cycle is over. And it was probably over by around the middle of this year. Uh, the slide that is on your screen at the moment shows you central bank policy rate expectations in three years' time. And in Australia, Australian financial markets are pricing in an RBA cash rate of 1.84%. So that's equivalent to seven or eight rate hikes over the next three years there. Uh, the RBA's guidance, indeed, in many parts of the world is that they are waiting until they get a more substantial recovery in employment before hiking rates. But the key thing to note is a number of central banks have started to hike rates already, particularly in New Zealand, which has lifted their cash rate uh, two times. It's likely that the Bank of England will start to hike rates uh, at the December meeting. And in the US, the US Fed is expected to hike rates uh, a few times in 2022. So the key, key point there is obviously the, the low point of the interest rate cycle is uh, over in that sense. And in terms of FX markets, uh, there has been a fair amount of volatility in regards to the Australian dollar and also in regards to other key currency pairs. And that volatility is likely to persist. After all, I don't think anyone was really thinking there was going to be a new virus variant so, so quickly and that emerged with so much uh, aggression there. So for, this, for the Australian dollar, you'd have to say the risks are probably to the downside in the near term, just given the uncertainty around the Omicron variant. As we start to learn a little bit more about that, virus variant, uh, and as we start to become a little bit more comfortable with the virus and are, are, are able to start the transition to living with the virus in terms of a more global sense, then that should support the Australian dollar uh, into next year. So we're expecting near-term downside risk to the Australian dollar over the next couple of months, but then for the Australian dollar towards the end of 2022 to start to lift up towards that 78 US cent level, just given where commodity prices are at the moment. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and then in terms of the geopolitical implications, I think this slide really shows you what has happened to Australian exporters over the past two years. And the chart on the left-hand side there shows you Australia's total goods exports to China on a rolling 12-month basis. And I've split that up in terms of our iron ore exports and in terms of our other exports to China. And just the divergence between what has occurred between our iron ore exports to China and everything else that was exported to China. And the geo geopolitical tensions between Australia and China uh, well known, so it's not worth rehashing there. But um, I guess in terms of the export implications, um, exporters to China found it very difficult to export product, particularly in the agricultural space, but also in some of the other commodity areas as well. And so that's forced exporters to really search for other markets. And I'm sure many of you have heard those anecdotes of Australia selling barley to Mexico to make Coronas. Um, and I think those kind of uh, developments will likely continue to emerge as the 
years go on. Um, as Arnold was saying before, Australia has uh, tied itself more towards the UK and the US in a geopolitical sense in terms of the ACOS Treaty. And so Australia-China relations might remain relatively frosty uh, for the next couple of years. So seeking out those alternative export markets, I think will be a top priority for exporters from here. Um, I'll leave it there. If there are any questions, uh, put them on chat and I'm happy to visit them when the Q&A starts. Back to you, Michael, and thank you for your time. No. Thanks, Tapas. Um, as always, um, you know, unbelievably insightful, but also just paints the picture as to how much volatility and how many uh, key dependencies that we've got and the unknowns that uh, we have in front of us uh, with the the, uh, the virus and and the new variants of that uh, virus. So, um, yeah, and on the topic of uh, economic activity and knowing um, how volatile the Aussie dollar can be, if you cast your mind back only to the start of the, uh, the pandemic, I think we saw a 55 cent dollar uh, only a year and a half ago. And so with those fluctuations and then impacts on, on interest rates and such, um, um, I just feel that uh, you know the, the number of challenges that we've all faced um, is a really critical component and could impact our businesses to the positive and negative and to the degree. So with that in mind, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Tracy Ferguson, who's NAB State Director for New South Wales Business Markets, and Todd Clemenson, who's NAB's Specialised Banking Executive for Trade and Working Capital. Because the two big variables that all of us face is actually currency, interest rates, and also working capital. Um, so um, Tracy's got extensive experience within financial markets, having spent many years working across both Australia and New Zealand, looking after businesses and corporate clients and also agri uh, clients. She now leads a team of financial market specialists um, uh, across foreign exchange and interest rates uh, who are really dedicated there to, to provide advice and support to our customers um, in terms of when they want to actually um, access offshore markets. Um, so with that, that, and then Todd is um, NAB state leader for New South Wales Trade and Working Capital. Um, he has a team of account management uh, that support business banking and agri customers, and he's been with NAB for over 14 years. And uh, basically um, driving the business development side for trade and invoice financing products um, in terms of managing the working capital cycle. Um, so like Tracy, Todd also leads a team of trade and working capital specialists who are committed to supporting all of you in, in your daily needs. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Tracy to discuss some of the aspects that we're currently seeing in terms of uh, foreign exchange and why it's so important uh, for businesses to, to really have a good handle on effectively managing those currency risks. Thank you, Michael. I will just go to the first slide um, and thank you to Tapas, uh, Leon and Arnold um, for their speeches today as well. So um, I think this slide sums it up, why NAB for Australian business? And we've been here supporting Australian business for the last 160 years. And we are Australia's largest business bank. We have 900 locations, 3,000 bankers and specialists on the ground. Um, so that gives you a, a, some scope of how we're here to support you as you enter into new export markets. And it would seem daunting, and obviously, by the um, slide pack that Arnold has put together, lots of challenges for business. Um, we're here today to to give you that confidence that NAB can support you in managing both your cash flow. Um, Todd will talk through um, some of the requirements there and I'll talk through some of the currency um, requirements as well. So we can just go to the next slide um, and see if we're a market leader that you can trust. And you can see here, as you sort of start to enter into new export markets, we're here to be with you throughout that whole cycle and through our in-depth knowledge, industry expertise and financial solutions. And Todd will talk to some of those financial solutions and you've heard, you've heard from our industry experts today. Um, we'll have a, a, a range of other um, presentations that we can support you with as well. Next slide, please. So you're growing your business, you're expanding offshore and exploring new markets. And you've, you've worked with the Export Council. Um, you're here now to what's next from here. Um, NAB's here to support you um, and provide, as I said, those industry solutions um, to help you um, through that uh, challenging timeframe. Next slide, please. International trade. So how does foreign exchange exposure arise? Um, so you've entered into an export contract and on, the, on a particular day in time, you're gonna ship goods worth about US 500,000. And on the day of that shipment, the Aussie US exchange rate is trading at 71 cents. 
So if you convert your US amount of uh, invoice, that will give you around about 704,000 Australian. So you've put that into your system and you know exactly how much Aussie dollars you're going to receive. You won't be paid by your buyer until 30 days, 30 to 60 days after that. So your exchange rate exposure is between the time that you enter into the contract, you raise an invoice, to the time you actually receive payment for your goods from your overseas buyer and convert that to Australian dollars. So the risks arise between the invoice time and the time that you make your payment. And as we'll, we've, we'll speak about Aussie volatility, if we look at the average volatility in the Aussie US exchange rate, it, it sometimes can trade in sort of 14 cent range. And as Michael mentioned last year, the low um, was 55 cents. So we're here to support you. And how do you manage that risk? Um, what sort of products can you use? And where can you go to get information around that? Defining and managing foreign exchange risk is critical in protecting your margins and supporting your business to do with confidence. Next slide, please. A framework to consider in when managing your risk and your NAB foreign exchange specialist or your relationship manager is on the ground to help you support and have these discussions. What is the purpose of a hedge policy framework? Is knowing what exposure you have, what's the timing of that exposure, what currencies are you exposed to, how do I set a budget level? How do I know how much Aussie dollars I'm going to receive? Um, when do you act? Who's going to be involved in making those decisions? What sort of products do I use? What percentage of hedging do I undertake? These are all questions that if you, we can work with you in developing out a framework. A lot of corporate companies have a policy. Um, it doesn't need to be fancy. It just needs to have a clear set um, plan, as um, we mentioned before, make a plan and have a systematic approach to undertaking your hedging program. Next slide, please. Where do you sit on the risk spectrum? We talk to a lot of small to medium enterprise. Some customers as entrepreneurs have a higher risk, risk, risk profile. Some have a lower risk profile. It depends on your business model. If you've got low margins, you're highly competitive, you want to set your prices for the long term, you want to understand what your profit margin is, you might have a lower tolerance for risk and therefore want to undertake hedging products to give you that certainty of cost. If your business model has a high margin business and you're able to on pass your, your, your profit, your sort of changes in price, price elasticity, or you have a bespoke offering, you may have a higher risk profile. Finding where you sit upon that risk spectrum will undertake how much hedging you take on board. And foreign exchange market specialists will be able to help you understand what your exposure is and work out a plan for you. Next slide, please. NAB markets, why us? As you can see, we are the market leader in FX solutions and services. We do have a 24 hour desk. We operate in 40 currencies. Uh, we have market specialists that offer personal advice and um, they're able to bespoke tailor conversations to you and your individual business needs. We don't just talk about product, we talk about what matters to you and obviously um, in, in how to support your business, your business. Next slide please. So from here um, if you need any assistance please read out, reach out to your local market specialist or your, your relationship manager I'll hand over to Todd Clemenson, who, who will talk through trade and working capital solutions to manage your export receipts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy, and, and thank you, Michael, for the early introduction. Uh, next slide, please. So nationally, the, the NAB trading working capital team averages over 2,000 customer connections each and every month. And many of these conversations are centered around businesses facing ongoing challenges in regards to cash flow management. This has never been more prevalent than in today's COVID impacted world. On the screen are many of these themes of conversation that we are currently holding with business, with a few more prevalent today than at any time previously. Words such as supply chain, slow, and costs can all relate to the current environment where shipping costs and delays have skyrocketed globally, impacting the ability to get hold of inventory in a timely manner at an affordable cost. Of course, many of these extra costs and time delays impact the business's cash flow and profit margins. Other themes of conversation such as liquidity, debtors, payables, and growth are nothing new. And over the next few minutes, I will discuss 
ways an international trading business can potentially manage cash flow in today's environment with the support of NAB. Next slide, please. So an agreeing to an appropriate payment method with, within international trade is a major factor in minimizing your payment and or delivery risk. The method of payment that is agreed between by both parties will be influenced by many factors, which may include conflicting cash flow and risk management issues. Whilst exporters would prefer to choose a method that provides them with their payment prior to shipment, the importer would rather opt for a method that defers their payment until the goods have arrived or even means on sold. So we can see from the uh, diagram here that from exporter versus an importer side, there's, there's a varying levels of risk depending on the method of payment selected and agreed negotiated between each party. In the next couple of slides, I'll touch on the ability to leverage a documentary credit scenario um, to leverage that and also an open account scenario as well. So in regards to layers of credit, uh, there's an, um, an action you can take, which is called confirmation. So for an exporter, then pay your goods you have shipped is your number one priority. We can minimize your payment risk by putting NAB's global rating and brand behind another bank's letter of credit in your favor. So once you've agreed on payment terms with your buyer and received their bank's letter of credit, there's still payment risks you cannot control. How stable or solvent is the issuing bank? What are the economic or political conditions in their country? And will a change affect their letter of credit issuing bank's ability to pay? So by putting NAB's global rating and brand behind the issuing bank by confirming their letter of credit, gives you assurance of a payment commitment from NAB. Our payment to you is without recourse. So when we pay you, we take on all the risks of obtaining payment from the issuing bank. So one of the key benefits of this sort of solution to support your cash flow is NAB will pay you immediately upon your presentation to us of compliance shipping documents. This is particularly valuable if you've been offered extended payment terms to your buyer. Next slide, please. Export trade finance is another uh, prominent um, solution or option available to businesses uh, undertaking international trade. It is suited to businesses that need short-term finance to manage cash flow needs and fund export sales. This is particularly important if you have granted extended payment terms to secure your sale. Our export trade finance solution provides working capital to assist with the costs associated with getting your goods to the point of shipment and improve cash flow while you're waiting for your buyer's payment. Next slide, please. So the benefits there around our export trade finance solution is flexibility, helping you manage your seasonal and day-to-day -day cash flow needs. Multi-currency, giving you the option to draw export trade finance, not only in Australian dollars, but in major foreign currencies as well. But also bargaining power. So thinking outside the box and thinking how you can use finance to obtain favorable um, supplier discounts with your suppliers um, to allow you to actually maybe offset some of the funding costs and actually um, create a profitable outcome for the business by paying earlier. Some of the key risks to, to maintain though is there's no guarantee of payment. So you would still need to undertake your um, due diligence in regards to who you're selling to um, and obtaining payment from them in a timely manner. Sanctions, of course, around international trade is very important in today's environment as, has ever, always, as it has always ever been. But it's really important to understand who you're dealing with, both from a buyer and a seller perspective and the risks around dealing with those um, individuals, but also the countries that are involved as well. Next slide, please. So exporting goods can be a daunting and risky business, particularly if you're a new player to the trade game. NAB's trading and capital specialists are local experts with worldwide knowledge that can help you overcome your obstacles and make what could be a complex process into something that is relatively simple to understand. That's it for me. I'll hand it back to Michael. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Michael. Sorry, I thought I'd clicked it properly. You'd think I'd uh, I'd know better after only a year and a half, but I'm back in the office, so I'm losing my touch from working at home. Um, but you know, thanks Tracy and Todd for um, sharing some of those examples, which are fairly much real life uh, um, examples of what a lot of the companies that uh, that face today in terms of the exposures that you run by doing these offshore trades and so forth. So um, absolutely critical that you get the right advice around that. 
It's now time to kick off um, a bit of the panel session, but uh, what we'll do is we'll create the panel through a Q&A session. So if anyone has got any of the uh, any questions, please put them into the Q&A component on Zoom and we can get going from there. The first question I have is for Arnold and it's um, what support um, does the ECA provide to businesses looking to export to new markets? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Michael. Uh, the ECA actually has previously focused on uh, training, especially on export readiness and, and trade documentation, as well as the, uh, as well as the provision of market information. But uh, due to the demand from exporters, uh, we're now providing research, uh, business matching, uh, and facilitation of actual market entry. So we've been able to do this uh, by actually building uh, our relationship globally. Uh, so we have established strategic partnerships uh, with various organizations uh, in Australia as well as overseas. Um, and of course, you know, National Australia Bank is, is one of our strategic partners. Uh, so it, it's, it's, uh, so we've decided to do this uh, in order for us to be able to help exporters with their various needs. Um, in, in many cases, uh, we won't actually have the internal capacity, but we can certainly refer exporters to those that can assist. Uh, and, and we can also arrange for significant discounts on the fees that they might actually uh, have to pay. Uh, again, this is actually part of the normal uh, exporting business process. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, the next question could be answered by um, potentially three of the panelists, um, you know, either Arnold or Tapas or, or Todd. Um, it says, the question is, many expect sea and air freight prices to remain elevated for several years, potentially never returning to pre-COVID levels. How do you foresee SMEs dealing with long-term elevated freight rates? So happy for either of you to answer the question. Tapas has come off mute. There you go. Just answer in terms of the elevated freight rates. I think there there is good reason to think those freight rates will start to drop off uh, midway through next year. And the key thing there is uh, goods demand is running about ten percent above pre-COVID levels in most countries around the world. And uh, we would expect as we start to transition to living with the virus, people. We'll start to pivot towards the services side of the economy and that will help ease up some of those uh, supply chain pressures just coming from unprecedented goods demand and i'm not sure about you but i have enough uh, home tech equipment enough home furniture um, i don't need to buy any more and so i think that kind of anecdotes will play out uh, right across the global economy uh, in terms of how um, smes are going to react um, to potentially persistently higher uh, freight rates i might pass that over to uh, someone who has probably a little bit more expertise in that area from my perspective, I think it's there'll be a tipping point for a business, for a SME, right? So they'll either up to a point uh, absorb the additional costs uh, and erode profit margins, but that will get to a point where they actually start starting to pass those on to the consumers and then the end buyer. Um, so I think we'll see over time if they remain elevated, um, increased costs in, uh, in regards to um, cost of goods, um, and obviously the consumer will pay for that ultimately. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Tapas. Um, the next question is for Leon. Um, given the uh, flavor tech experiences, uh, Leon, um, what have been some of your challenges uh, looking for new export markets and offshore clients? I, I suppose um, the challenge is always finding the right person to speak to, finding the the finding where. Uh, the regulations are about exporting to those markets, finding out uh, whether there's free trade agreements, finding out how to transport things and how business is done there. There's also that cultural fit. And, and as an exporter dealing with, with different countries and different nationalities, you really have to communicate in the correct way with, uh, with the companies in, in those countries. Um, Resources for this is, of course, the Export Council, um, is, of course, Austrade, um, finding out uh, who to communicate with, who, to, who, to, who can network, um, and, and who can get you in front of your customers in, in the future. Um, a couple, of, a couple of times we've actually gone on business trade missions um, that have been run by government departments. And that is a, a nice way to get out there in a very uh, casual manner to, to meet with, with companies and uh, also to attend exhibitions as, as a group 
um, to find out uh, consumers, to talk to consumers and talk to other companies. So one of the challenges is, is always finding the right people. The other challenge, of course, uh, that we find is um, how they'd like to pay. And, uh, you know, we've recently been doing business with Russia. Um, and, and of course, one of the, the ways NAB has helped us there is, you know, bank guarantees um, and being able to put together a standby letter of credit that is, uh, is with a, a bank that the, that the, uh, the Russian company uh, has dealings with. And of course, uh, uh, you know, the NAB here in, in Australia. So um, I'd like to say that that's being shipped next week, uh, which so everything's gone very, very well. Um, and, you know, doing business with different countries, especially countries you haven't dealt with, always provides a challenge. So finding the right resources and talking to the NAB on the financial matters has really assisted us. Great. Thank you, Leon. Um, the next question is um, probably for Tracy and uh, Tapas. It's um, why has the Aussie uh, deviated from fundamental drivers? Sure, yeah. So in terms of where our models would say the Australian dollar should be trading, I'm probably saying the Aussie should be closer to 78 or 80 US cents. And uh, the key reason is, is because the biggest fundamental for the Australian dollar over the past uh, 25 years has been commodity prices, and commodity prices are just so elevated at the moment. Uh, in terms of why the Aussie has been lower than that, it seems like uh, financial markets are putting greater weight on uh, non non commodity price factors. And the key things there are the first one is the RBA, uh, which is likely to lag the rate hike cycle by a number of other different central banks. So um, I was, as I was saying before earlier, while the low point of the interest rate cycle is over, the RBA is still saying that they're not going to hike rates until maybe 2024 or perhaps uh, 2023. And you put that into contrast with the US Fed, uh, where they're expected to start hiking rates in 2022 and by multiple times in 2022. Um, and then the second factor is uh, in terms of the outlook for emerging markets and particularly around the Delta variant um, and other variants themselves. Um, emerging markets on the whole uh, don't have as high vaccine coverage and uh, that's despite the World Health Organization lobbying a lot of advanced economies to prioritize the vaccination with a lot of developing economies and the Australian dollar is seen as a proxy for global growth and global risk uh, and uh, emerging markets are definitely a key part of that as well. Uh, and uh, the third and final factor that has been starting to play in a little bit of it is um, China, uh, sorry, the, the Australian dollar has been historically seen as a proxy for investment uh, in to China. And just given the China, Australia, uh, you'd have to say, at least um, in terms of that relationship, um, some of that toxic flow may still be going to step away. But in terms of the outlook for the Australian dollar, we definitely do see uh, the risks and downside over the next couple of months, just given the uncertainties around the Omicron variant and other factors that are going on in the global economy at the moment, particularly the high US dollar. Uh, and uh, we still expect the Australian dollar to grind up uh, in the second half of next year, getting back to that US dollar. As those fundamentals start to reset, and as the RBA starts to towards high. Yeah, I think you're right, Tabs. I think certainly for our customers that we speak to, the challenges around <laughs> um, forecasting um, is a, is a is a challenge given yeah. you know that the currency doesn't always operate on fundamentals and very much that as you spoke about risk sentiment, um, which is hard to sort of quantify um, just where the market, it all beca always becomes a, a US dollar story. And I'm always, you know, the, the stat that fascinates me is the currency is the fifth largest traded currency in the world. So that's, that's a big number for a relatively small country. And, and you can see the impact for customers that are just importing and exporting on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the time that they make their payment or they receive their payment in can be very heavily impacted by something that's happened offshore completely out of their control. So knowing that risk and managing that risk becomes even more important during volatile times. Thanks, Tapas and Tracy. Um, the next question is for Arnold. Um, are there any trade barriers or threats that businesses need to look out for when looking to expand uh, to emerging growth markets? 
Um, look, there's a, a number of challenges, uh, and it will depend on on the the product uh, as well as the country that they're trying to to go to. Uh, if you're exporting avocado, for example, to a country which we do not actually have a bilateral protocol uh, arrangement with that country, then in effect, uh, the idea is dead in the water before you actually even begin. Uh, so it's really important to actually do the research. Uh, and uh, I, again, uh, it, it's really quite important to understand who, uh, who your partner is in, in that country. Uh, that's very important. Uh, they can make uh, everything so much easier for you. Uh, so in that context, that initial preparation is very important and you need to actually put in the, the, uh, the right resources in place at the very beginning. Uh, so you need to make sure that you have the the resources to, to commit to uh, once you start looking to a new market. Uh, just very quickly, um, I'd suggest uh, while there are various uh, different tools of analysis that's, that's out there uh, for a lot of exporters, maybe uh, think about the CAGE uh, distance framework, uh, which is an acronym for cultural, uh, administrative, geographic and economic uh, distance uh, framework. So it's just a useful handy kind of tip uh, to think about, you know, how how uh, how far is the cultural distance between Australian culture with with uh, with Korea, for example, uh, and geographically, of course, you know, it's easier to trade with New Zealand than than say Europe, where uh, we're talking about the freight cost and so forth. So you have to to maybe use some of these kind of uh, tools to to help you go through at least some of these kind of uh, analysis. Thank you, Arnold. Um, the the next question is actually for me. Um, aside from FX and trade, how else does NAB support businesses who are looking to grow and expand their businesses overseas? Um, you know, first and foremost, it's actually uh, through the provision of some of the experts that you see um, on the screen here in terms of our, our FX component, our trade and working capital specialists. Underpinning that is all you call uh, banking requirements that you would need everything from transactional accounts uh, to be able to uh, accommodate that um, asset finance in terms of equipment that you might need to manufacture or produce the goods that you're exporting or, or moving into foreign markets. Um, uh, capital loans to um, you know, for premises. So all of those capital requirements is what, uh, what uh, NAB can actually provide to customers looking to, to expand. Um, and uh, as I said up front, the transactional accounts as well. Um, there's one more question here for Tapas. What is your time frame on supply chain? Uh, is that right? Yeah, on supply chain freight rates being as high as they are. Yeah, it's a very good question and a question that I'm being asked increasingly. And, and I think I um, alluded to it before. It really was driving those high freight rates in two factors. So one, uh, all the COVID-19 disruptions, particularly in terms of lockdowns. And the second one is just elevated goods consumption. So with elevated goods consumption, uh, that's likely to start to dissipate and people start to pivot towards the services side of the economy. And that will be a greater process, but that will occur. Uh, and then the second one in terms of when countries start to live more with COVID, and obviously Omicron is the great uncertainty here, uh, but it, it, making the very large assumption that, um, of, that Omicron is very transmission transmissible, but maybe not as severe as other variants, uh, then you'd probably start to um, see some easing up on all those uh, disruptions caused by those restrictions uh, towards the middle of next year. And that's primarily because it looks like a number of countries are, are waiting until they roll out their booster program um, to provide an extra degree of protection there. And that's particularly in regards to China. So, uh, so, so China's booster program is underway and it looks like that will be complete by the middle of next year. In terms of Europe, we obviously had uh, reports of lockdowns being re-instituted in Austria and enhanced restrictions in a number of other countries there. And that was prior to the Omicron uh, variant. And when we looked in terms of the reason why case numbers were rising in Europe, um, it was mainly, it was basically 50% due to the un unvaccinated. And uh, in, in terms of that, we know what to do there. And I appreciate that many of you on the webinar would have different views on this, but one way is we can motivate people to get vaccinated through different incentives. Um, and then the second one is um, there was an increase in uh, hospitalizations by those who are older, so over the age of 70, and who were fully vaccinated. And it seemed like the efficacy of the vaccines were fading after about six months. And so that's a reason why a, a lot of countries are really pursuing uh, the, the booster rollout. So once those boosters are 
rolled out and as we start to transition towards living with a virus, then I think some of those supply chain disruptions start to ebb and you start to see um, an easing up in freight costs there. And you're starting to see a little bit of it in terms of the spot freight rates, uh, although they are extremely elevated at the moment. So I'm very hopeful towards the middle of next year, uh, freight rates will be lower than they are currently. Great. Thanks, Tapas. I think we might have time just for um, one more question, and it's for you, Tracy. Um, I've always used a non-bank FX provider due to sharp pricing. How does NAB compare, and what additional value can NAB provide from a FX uh, perspective? Certainly. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as Australia's um, largest FX provider, so in terms of um, both operating in volumes and, and key market price maker in the Australian market, and we will always remain um, competitive um, and, and match match that pricing. I think the key difference in terms of our value proposition here at National Australia Bank, as I mentioned before, is our ability to be able to provide personal advice to our customer base. Um, under our licensing, and um, we're able to take into account individual personal circumstances relating to those business objectives. Um, we are the only major bank um, at this stage that is running a personal advice model in the foreign exchange and a lot of the non-bank providers operate under a general advice, here's a product, um, you know, hopefully that fits, fits your needs. So we pride ourselves on really being a relationship bank uh, and really understanding and knowing our clients and really offering products that match their needs. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, unfortunately, um, that's all we've got time for today in terms of the Q&A piece, but if there's any questions that we haven't got to, uh, we will definitely respond directly back to you uh, personally. Um, so that just leaves me to close. And you know, I have to say, I think we're very fortunate to have had such an experienced um, panel of industry professionals with, here with us today. It's been great to understand the key growth opportunities that are present in various export markets around the world and the challenges that come with trying to expand uh, uh, into offshore markets, as well as um, the importance of managing you know, company cash flows and currency exposures that arise from all of these international expansions. And it's absolutely critical that we clearly understand where those risks lie. Um, it would be a miss of me not to say thank you to our fabulous guest speakers today. And that's Arnold, Leon, Tapas, Tracy and Todd. Um, truly appreciate the time that you've given us today and the insights that you've been able to share. Um, and also uh, would be remiss of me not to say thank you to everyone that's actually joined um, this webinar. Um, for those of you that are uh, at NAB customers, um, I truly am grateful that you are NAB customers because I know that you've all got choices. Anyone that isn't a NAB customer, we'd love to have a chat to you about how you can be and how we can actually provide true insights and value um, to your companies and your operations. Um, I truly hope that you found today's session valuable. And if you took away one or two things, then I think then uh, we've achieved what we set out to achieve. And and you know, there's a couple of key messages there around whether those growth markets might be insights in terms of the importance of, of FX risk management and cash flow, um, and having that all in place before those expansion opportunities start to come uh, to play. Um, you know, NAB's really honoured to be um, a strategic partner of the Ex Export Council, and I would also like to highlight the value that they provide to Australian businesses, small and large, uh, in supporting them in their exporting and growth um, aspirations. At the close of today's session, um, you'll receive a pop-up survey requesting your feedback on, on what you heard today, uh, the value that you got out of it. You know, for us to get better, uh, we'd really appreciate um, if you could take a couple of minutes to provide that feedback to us. And um, one more time, thank you. Thanks to the panel. And uh, we really appreciate uh, you uh, you joining this webinar today. Have a great rest of uh, your Tuesday. Cheers.